So I said, okay, are we ready to go under? No, 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 she said. How about if we dive in and come right back up and we'll go together on the count of three? Three, two, one, splash, we dove in. Freezing, our head was so cold. But we had accomplished our goal, so we celebrated by shouting and splashing each other for a while. And then a few minutes later, my daughter got this look in her eye, and she said, you know, I don't feel cold at all anymore. Habituation. A gift, to be certain, as in this case, of our adaptability. And a quality of our human experience necessary to survival. Habituation helps us to acclimatize to that new job that we kind of hate at the beginning. Habituation helps us to endure human suffering and pain. It helps us when relationships fall apart. We all have that friend who's ready to say, time heals all wounds, habituation at work. Unfortunately, there are negative costs to habituation, especially in our contemporary society. That job becomes harder and harder to leave as we stick it out in relative unhappiness year after year. That human suffering and pain becomes dulled over time and can produce victims habituating to continued abuse. The societal norms that we're born into or have simply lived alongside for as long as we can remember. A population used to civil structures with systemic discrimination. Our societal inaction regarding those who are underhoused or suffer with addiction. Our comfort with social bubbles. Not wanting to realize the discrimination of our neighbors right next to us. Or perhaps a church living out a safe and comfortable model. This is the way we've always done it. Surely we've all heard of that 19th century study of a frog that's being boiled alive in a pot of water. And he won't jump out because the incremental increases in temperature are just so very gradual. Like that frog, are we destined to habituate to our surroundings and repetitive actions, stuck in a paradigm that may eventually cause harm to ourselves, our communities, our planet. Perhaps this is just a reframing of a familiar territory for us. We know that we are adaptable, and we also know we run the risk of apathy. So how do we dishabituate? Angels. Angels stir us from our torpor and invigorate our senses. Angels provide new perspective. Angels appear to the shepherds in the fields, not to frighten or demand, but to share the vision of a new kingdom of heaven here on earth. An angel closed the mouths of lions, protecting Daniel and changing the outlook of King Darius. An angel gave Peter the strength to literally break free his bonds in prison. An angel comforted Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and gave him the strength to move forward in the face of what was to come. Or how about the Good Samaritan we just heard about? True, not a traditional angel, but think about the etymology of the word. A messenger, an outsider, bringing a message of compassion and love. A message to break down barriers and accept the oneness of creation. Remember that frog that wouldn't jump out of the boiling pot? Well, you might also recall that it's not true. The scientific observations of some German scientists in the 19th century were found to be unrepeatable and disproved many times over by 20th century studies. In other words, frogs have a hardwired idea of how hot is too hot, and they'll jump out. All parts of the natural world have a breaking point. Angels try to arrive before that breaking point, to shake off the status quo, to dishabituate us from our traditional ideas. Man singet mit Freuden vom Sieg. There are joyful songs of victory. Bach composed tonight's cantata for the feast of St. Michael and all angels in 1729 during his third cycle of cantatas in Leipzig. This is the only feast day 
that includes trumpets and timpani in every setting that Bach wrote. But tonight's cantata has a very different feel to that of its counterparts. They all highlight the war in heaven we heard, the vanquishing of the dragon, casting out of Satan and his followers. But tonight's cantata paints with very different colors. Let's have a listen to the opening of a different cantata. This one's called Hergott dich loben alle wir. Field trumpets and kettle drums, musical instruments of war, angular rhythms and militaristic feel. Yay, team angels! <laughs> Now, let's have a listen to the way those same instruments, just the trumpets and timpani, open tonight's cantata. So much more like a dance, not like marching troops. It's the same story, but this time told from above with a heavenly sheen. Quite literally from above, actually, as the trumpets would have been placed in the balconies of St. Thomas's or St. Nicholas's in Leipzig. The choir, likewise, does not sing the cantus firmus of a patriotic hymn, but joins in the dance. text they sing, taken from Psalm 118. There are joyful sounds of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. It's far from coincidence that Bach used a psalm associated with Easter and the resurrection of Jesus. The victory is not only the angels over Satan, but life over death, action over inaction. And take special note of the way the choir treats the word Freuden, joy. It gets very special treatment in that movement. The bass aria that follows is perhaps closer to the battle than the opening choruses. We immediately hear the struggle and the back and forth in the introduction. The text continues that idea, going as far as finishing a downward vocal phrase with the text, den Satanus verjagt, driven Satan away, or driven Satan downward, as it were. Still, the poetry remains ambiguous and continues to highlight and connect us to the resurrection, to new life through Jesus' sacrifice. The mezzo recit that continues the cantata contains probably my favorite bit of poetry, in this piece, when they ask the question, how could it be possible to despair? Once the support of the angels is recognized, once we accept the possibility of a new way forward, how could it be possible to despair? Next, the soprano aria takes on a new tone, presenting the angels in a softer, more human light. Again, we have a dance form to gain closeness. The aria, along with the preceding recit, introduce us to hopeful and reassuring angels. The alto and tenor duet that follows is perhaps the most interesting movement you'll hear this evening. It functions really as a trio with our two vocalists and the bassoon. Be wakeful, ye holy watchers, the night is almost over. 
There are some sources that translate as, be wakeful ye guardian angels. Not a direct translation, but extremely helpful to point us toward yet another way to see and hear angels. The cantata finishes with a chorale that would have been well known to Bach's community. While the melody remains intact, Bach's harmonic language in the chorale is what we would refer to as unsettled. We never quite end up in the place we think we're going to. Listen to the first two phrases of that hymn tune, just the melody first. And now listen to the same twin phrases and the way Bach treats them a little differently. Bach dishabituates us from our expectations. And even a well-known chorale tune can become something new, something changed. So, where are all these angels now? Well, I don't think they're at coronations, and I don't think they're at wars. I'm not really sure if they're watching over our sleeping children right now. I'm not going to tell you that we're all angels in the vein of we are all saints, no. In fact, it seems likely that most people in our lives are not our angels. Most people in our lives, unintentionally or otherwise, are the opposite, as they work to hold us in our comforts and routines. The angels are working through those people and situations in our lives that allow us to dishabituate, to ask questions to stand on the balcony of our lives and look inward objectively. When we have reached our own breaking points, could we identify those points along the journey when angels appeared? Could we be those angels to our own communities? Let this 20 minutes of music and poetry, of faith and doubt, be your angel this evening. Or as our friend John Campbell liked to say, let this be your little piece of heaven.